Howdy everyone, this is Roaming Prepper, I'm your host Pete, and thank you for joining me today. Today we have a kind of a atypical subject, but something I think is now relevant uh, to what's going on in the world. I want to talk a little bit about small wars. I think uh, this is something that not only is important for us to understand, but we may be witnessing it. Again, this is my opinion, and we may be witnessing it in several different places. So let's talk about this. Uh, I'll be right back and we will get into what this subject really is. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for joining me again. Don't forget, as always, if you have any questions uh, that I may not cover in the actual premiere of this video, uh, which I normally try to premiere and attend my own premiere, please put it in the chat comments below and I will get back to you as quick as I can. Um, more than likely, when this particular video posts, I will be on the road, so I'll reply as soon as I can. In any case, Going back to the subject, what exactly is a small war? Well, there's a great website that kind of discusses it in detail called the Small Wars Journal. Uh, but essentially, small wars are basically not full conventional wars, but more conflicts, uh, situations, uh, operations that occur between countries to try and obtain a certain outcome. Typically, the intent is to create a situation such that another country or another player, another stakeholder, winds up doing what you want because you have forced their hand in some way, shape, or form. Uh, these kind of wars are very hard to define, but they're very clear to understand once you've seen them. They typically take place between asymmetrically uh, balanced countries. So for instance, a larger country will uh, be against a smaller in the conventional sense. Now in the past, historically speaking, uh, wars were fought between nations, between kings, between uh, barons, where you had large battlefields and armies uh, set up against each other. The small war concept has been around really since the, in its formal current sense, since the 80s and 90s, and it really came about with the Marine Corps bombing of the barracks in Beirut back in 83. But since then, it's it's become more clear that um, the small wars concept is basically using small groups or smaller conflicts to change the outcome of a larger geopolitical uh, scenario. A good example of what started as a small war was the revolution, the American Revolution. Originally, it was a group of individuals in certain areas, for example, Lexington uh, in, in Massachusetts and other areas who were upset with the conduct of the British government at the time. The king, they felt it was unfair, regardless of the reasons, um, these individuals took up arms at a local level against the established government uh, at the time. Again, asymmetrically opposed foes. Um, this became an extended war, and uh, actually Washington used the small wars concept in many of his battles. Uh, he wouldn't, uh, after learning painful lessons in large-scale conflicts in an open battlefield, uh, the the Revolutionary Army or the Continental Army became very good at using smaller groups and hitting the British in odd places. One example is the crossing of the river during Christmas Eve to rout an entire Hessian division uh, in the middle of the night. Uh, that was kind of a concept of a small war that ultimately resulted in the smaller country winning. You're seeing it in Ukraine. The Ukrainians have mastered the ability of hitting the Russians in certain areas and then leaving or dispersing when a large counterattack comes only to come back somewhere else. They're using a small wars concept. Now, ironically, the entire Ukrainian operation 
which was considered a special military operation, is not technically a war. That was actually a pseudo small war. Russia was hoping to quickly go in and decapitate Ukraine and take over the nation. They failed, and unfortunately what wound up happening for the Russians is they consolidated Ukrainian support behind their president, and hence now it's dragged out. One thing should be noted is that small wars are not necessarily short wars. The American Revolution lasted for years, people don't realize, uh, it was a four or five year war. The Vietnam War is another one. That's a great example of the Viet Cong conducting small war operations against a much larger foe who ultimately lost political will to continue the fight. In hindsight, the U.S. could have won that war had they continued that, that path, but the political regime changed. And ultimately, the Viet Cong got what they wanted. They got the Amer they forced the Americans to leave, much like the Revolutionary Army forced the British to leave. And at the end, they got a certain geopolitical outcome, which is what they desired. Now, small wars are often used with smaller units and smaller targets. And the goal is to hit certain things or create certain situations that force other countries to change what they're doing or how they're conducting themselves resulting in a win geopolitically, whatever that goal is, for the smaller adversary or the whichever adversary wants that outcome. So why are these small wars important? Well, and again, this is purely my opinion. This is purely hypothetical. But if I were a leader of a country and I wanted to engage in warfare against another country, and we were evenly matched, or even the other country had more powerful military, I would not want to meet them head on in an open battlefield or in open sea battles. That would ultimately result in my losing. Instead, I would conduct smaller wars, misinformation campaigns. I would conduct infiltration of the country and steal their information. I would also do things like agitate the infrastructure, either with my own operatives or by manipulating dissatisfied individuals in the country in question and causing them to take action. Whereas my hands are clean because it was none of my people who did it. I simply manipulated someone else to get that outcome. Ultimately, the goal is to cause the other country to create a misstep. Now, why do I bring all this up? Because ultimately, what we're witnessing maybe a series of small wars across the globe. Remember when Ukraine was first invaded by the Russian special military operation, all of a sudden Russia was starting to have explosions in refineries, pipelines blow up, air fuels catch fire, not within the proximity of the war zone, but hundreds of kilometers, if not hundreds of you know miles away from the battlefield. They were happening well within the Russian regime. That would be an example of a small war. Things happening in the background that are affecting, ultimately forcing Russia to move assets to deal with those situations or disrupting their operations so that it gave the advantage to the smaller army, in this case, the Ukrainians. What are we witnessing now in the United States and in North America? We've seen a lot of infiltration by flying objects of various types. I actually just did another video where did it go? Which is basically discussing where did the UFOs go after we took down the spy balloon? Uh, go watch that video. I think you'll get a kick out of that. But we're also seeing multiple derailments, some of which are quite catastrophic. We're seeing refineries catching fire. We're seeing attacks on power station. Oddly enough, a lot of some of these incidents are occurring at the hands of domestic individuals who are dissatisfied with, with the current status of things. Were they manipulated? Were they actually a pawn in a small war, even if they didn't realize it? A lot of questions, but I'll tell you what, for to see one company such as Pemex have three massive fires or incidents in three refineries in two countries on the same day is highly suspicious, highly unusual. Having worked as an engineer, I know these refineries, these facilities have significant, significant safeguards. Unless it was blazing incompetence, and even then, one area, somebody makes a mistake, 
that's an industrial accident. You have multiple incidents occurring across multiple places at the same time, across national borders, there's something else going on. So I want everyone to take a minute and just think about how a small war concept, doing small operations to disrupt another nation, may be getting applied right now. Again, this is hypothetical. This is purely a conversation piece. But I'll tell you what, the things we're seeing and at the rate they're happening seems really weird. And maybe we're just paying better attention now. Maybe we're more focused as a community on what's going on. But I'll tell you something, you need to pay attention to your surroundings at all times. Whether you believe there's a small war going on or there is some kind of other operation, or if it's just horrendously bad luck, which again, that would be pushing it even for me. Either way, are you ready for those kind of scenarios? Are you ready to go to work, come out of the office door of the building and realize that there's been a refinery blew up and the streets are contaminated? Or there's been some kind of other incident and you cannot drive home? Is it even worth taking your vehicle out of the parking lot or should you just start going on foot so you don't have to abandon your vehicle somewhere in public in the middle of nowhere? These are all questions we need to ask ourselves. Are you ready to leave your office and go home on foot? Do you know how? Do you have places to stop along the way? What if you're like me? I travel multiple cities at one time. I've driven literally from Houston to Dallas to West Texas down to Austin through San Antonio and back to Houston. That was a seven, eight day trip. Every two days I was in a new city, new hotel with my gear and my belongings. At any time things can happen. Do you have a plan for that? Have you even thought about it? Even if you're just taking the kids to see grandma or grandpa, see a family member, what if you don't make it? What if something happens when you're there or something even worse happens on the way there and you're stuck in that vehicle? These are the kind of questions all of us need to ask ourselves. So I encourage all of you to sit down and think, how do I travel? Do I only stay in my town? Do I go to visit relatives? Do I fly? Do I take a train? And then ask yourself, if I get stopped halfway between where I am and where I wanna be, what am I gonna do? This is not to scare people, but this is to make you think. Because if small wars are indeed occurring, and again, this is purely a conversational topic, or if we're just having the worst freaking luck, either way, you could get caught in the middle of somewhere that you're not familiar with, with your kids, with your family, with your dog, with yourself, you might be absolutely alone. Do you have you thought of that? And do you have the amenities you need to at least give you some time? If nothing else, you can't stop a disaster, but you can give yourself time to stop and think about what's happening and what you can do about it. If I have enough in my get home bag that I can survive functionally for 48 hours if nothing else, that just gave me 48 hours to sit down and figure out what the heck to do. And that, my friends, might be the difference between me getting back to my loved ones or to a safe place, or me not getting found again and becoming a, either a refugee or a casualty in something larger. So folks, I don't want you to freak, but I do want you to think about this because something is amiss and either we've forgotten after 150 years or 200 years of using trains, using roads, and using refineries, how to work these things, or something greater is going on. Regardless, making those preparations will keep you ready to face those challenges should they arrive. Guys, think about it. Until next time, God bless, God speed, and I will see you all on the next video. Stay frosty out there. Things are getting weird. Take care.